Well, as we continue our study of Acts chapter 15, we'll find ourselves taking a few detours, kind of like we did when studying the Torah. Um, this is necessary in order to address issues and subjects that are subtly woven into the fabric of Acts 15 so that we can extract from this chapter the intended meaning. And no, we won't be finishing Acts chapter 15 today. Now, I've explained a number of times that the primary issue that created the perceived need for this Jerusalem council to convene was circumcision. As far as we know, by the way, it's the first meeting of its kind for the Messianic believers. And this arose due to the desire of Gentiles and at the instruction of Christ that Gentiles were to be included in the Yeshua movement. But an almost as significant issue was that the places where Gentile believers met were of course the same synagogues where the Jewish believers met. And this created a problem, a problem of ritual purity, at least in the minds of many Jews. At the bottom of the ritual purity issue was circumcision. Circumcision and ritual purity are, from the Jewish perspective, at least welded together into a single issue. And that issue is what we see developing in the lead up to Acts chapter 15. So let's begin today by having a deeper discussion on this matter of circumcision. Now from the purely earthly physical aspect, the act of circumcision is a procedure that removes the foreskin from the male reproductive organ. For mature males, it is painful, highly uncomfortable, and filled with a lot of anxiety. <clears throat> For many centuries, it has been practiced by various ethnic groups and races for all kinds of purposes, some religious, some societal. So for many cultures who practice circumcision, it's performed on infants. The Bible commands that it's performed on the eighth day of life. Be aware that in some of the, some other of the world societies, that it's considered a rite of passage, a rite of passage into adulthood. So around the age of 13 to 15, male adolescents will have a circumcision procedure. In the Western world, some Christian denominations have historically seen it as a religious observance. In other cases, it was seen as a beneficial medical procedure to keep males healthier. More recently, the medical benefits versus health risks have been challenged. And some nations, especially the European nations, have banned the procedure altogether as they have lately deemed it to be nothing more than a primitive form of mutilation. Of course, the reality is that few males in Europe were still having circumcisions anyway. Therefore, it's blatantly obvious that this new law banning circumcision was aimed directly at the only group who practiced circumcision as a required religious rite, the Jews. In other words, it's just another thinly disguised European anti-Semitic attack upon the Jews. Now the first mention of circumcision is in Genesis chapter 17, and it's directly attached to the Abrahamic covenant. Let's read this together. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 15. Genesis chapter 17, we're going to read verses 7 through 14. Follow along with me, please. I am establishing my covenant between me and you along with your descendants after you generation after generation as an everlasting covenant 
to be God for you and for your descendants after you. I will give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are now foreigners, all the land of Canaan as a permanent possession. I will be their God. And God said to Avraham, as for you, you are to keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, generation after generation. Here is my covenant, which you are to keep between me and you, along with your descendants after you. Every male among you is to be circumcised. You are to be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. This will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. Generation after generation, every male among you who is eight days old is to be circumcised, including slaves born within your household and those bought from a foreigner not descended from you. The slave born in your house and the person bought with your money must be circumcised. Thus my covenant will be in your flesh as an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who will not let himself be circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person will be cut off from his people because he has broken my covenant. <clears throat> Notice some important features about this covenant that requires circumcision. First, circumcision is a sign. That is, it's an outward affirmation of being a participating member of the covenant. This is not a tradition. It's not a custom. It's not a man-made device of any kind. And it's not an option. It is demanded. It is commanded by God. Second, those that bear this sign represent God's set-apart people as created by the Abrahamic covenant. Those who refuse the sign also refuse the covenant with as many benefits and thus they are excluded from God's people. Third, this sign applies not only to Hebrews but to Gentiles who have in one way or another become attached to the Hebrews. In Genesis 17, the attachment is by being a slave. Now remember, no Hebrew can own a Hebrew slave. So this is specifically referring to foreign Gentiles. But as time goes on, we're going to find other ways in the Torah that Gentiles could become attached to the Hebrews. Fourth, while circumcision is not a man-made doctrine, it is performed by men upon other men. It is physical, external, and fleshly. However, as with all the signs and devices and rituals that God would give to the Hebrews, especially as he gave them to Moses on Mount Sinai, these were to be outward symbols of inward spiritual traits and or they are earthly representations of how things are in the spiritual realm. Moses was told that the wilderness tabernacle and its furnishings were modeled after Jehovah's heavenly throne room, for instance. I characterized this God principle very early on when we first began to study the biblical Torah and I named it the reality of duality. That is, there is generally speaking a spiritual counterpart for most all physical things. And the spiritual came first. So the physical was modeled after it. And so the spiritual would necessarily be more perfect, more complete than anything that could be fashioned or accomplished in the, the, the physical sphere. Thus, everything that is physical is by definition an inferior copy when compared to its spiritual, original, and counterpart. And it is the same with the act of circumcision. Now, circumcision ought to have been an outward sign of something that occurred deep within the spirits of the Hebrews. That was God's intention. Later, the same was to happen with the Torah, the Word of God. 
While the Torah was presented to humankind, Hebrew humankind, on stone tablets, yet it was written with the spiritual finger of God. And it was intended by God that the Torah would be written on our inward parts and our spirits. This is not some nice poetic thought coming from your pastor. This is what the Holy Scripture tells us. Let's read it together. Turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 204. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Please read along with me. We're going to read the first nine verses of Deuteronomy 6. Now this is the mitzvah, the, the command, the laws and rulings from which your God, Adonai, your God ordered me to teach you for you to obey in the land you are crossing over to possess so that you will fear Adonai, your God, and observe all of his regulations and commandments that I'm giving you. You, your child, and your grandchild as long as you live so that you will have long life. Therefore, listen, Israel. Take care to obey so that things will go well with you, so that you will increase greatly as Adonai, the God of your ancestors, promised you by giving you a land flowing with milk and honey. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel. Adonai our God, Adonai is one. And you are to love Adonai your God with all your heart, all your being, all your resources. These words which I'm ordering you today are to be on your heart. You are to teach them carefully to your children. You are to talk about them when you sit at home, when you're traveling on the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them on your hand as a sign. Put them at the front of a headband around your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. <clears throat> so the Lord made it the responsibility of humans, again, Hebrew humans, to write the laws of Moses onto their own hearts. History shows us that few heeded that commandment. And so we see that very quickly, the Hebrew people attempted to perform and obey all the laws and commandments that God gave to them by mechanically following them as one would follow a recipe from a cookbook. But soon they were skipping steps. They were substituting ingredients because these commands were not written on their hearts. Meaning the commandments had not become integrated into their being as part of their human spiritual DNA. So even though they may have been able to perform many of these commandments according to the letter of the law of the Torah, without these commandments being written on their hearts, they were not able to perform all of them, nor perform them according to the spirit of the law. Thus the Lord needed a remedy for this failure of faithfulness by his set-apart people. The remedy would eventually be pronounced in the book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 31, verses 30 to 33, we hear this. Here, the days are coming, says Adonai, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them by their hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt because they, for their part, violated my covenant, even though I, for my part, was a husband to them, says Adonai. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Adonai. I will put my Torah within them and write it on their hearts. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. I want you to back up for a second. I'm not done reading this, but hear this carefully. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I'll put my Torah within them and write it on their hearts. That's the covenant. 
I will be their God, they will be my people. No longer will any of them teach his fellow community member or his brother, no Adonai, for all will know me. From the least of them to the greatest. Because I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Funny when you read it, think about it for a minute, what it actually says the new covenant is. I will put my Torah within them and write it on their hearts. That is my covenant. So, let me say this another way. What did God say was the main feature of this new covenant with Israel and Judah? He said he would write it. What's it? The Torah. On the hearts of his people. The thing that he ordered the Hebrews to do for themselves, we read back in Deuteronomy 6, but which they did not do, write the Torah upon their own hearts. He has now graciously taken it upon himself to do it supernaturally. This is a new covenant about the Torah. It's not about creating a new and different Torah that replaces the former one. No such hint is in those verses. So the issue that the Lord is pursuing in humanity is for us to follow him and to relate to him first in our hearts, our minds. Because it's our hearts that are necessarily the point of connection between his spirit and our spirit. It is the spiritual connection that's most vital. It is the spiritual that drives and controls the physical. The ancient sages and rabbis recognized this fact about not having the Torah written on their hearts. Even if over the centuries when following the law of Moses gave way to following halakha, Jewish law, and the earthly and physical came to dominate Judaism, the spiritual became almost trivial. And the physical rituals and behaviors became everything. Back in the 18th century, Rabbi Schnur Zalman, who lived in Russia, and was the first Rebbe of the Chabad movement within Judaism, wrote a fascinating discourse on the subject of circumcision because he thought that that was at the heart of reforming Judaism. The Chabad movement formed exactly because many Jews felt that Judaism had abandoned its spiritual component. They wanted to recapture it. He had several marvelous things to say about circumcision, some of which merely reminds us of the rather traditional viewpoints of Judaism, but he also makes points that every Messianic believer and Christian Bible student ought to pay attention to. The first thing Rabbi Zalman notes is that circumcision of the heart is directly related to repentance. God first said that Hebrews were to circumcise themselves and to write the Torah on their own hearts. But when they failed, it became necessary for God to do it for them in the form of circumcising their hearts. Once the heart was circumcised, then the Torah law could be carried out to its fullest and in the highest spiritual sense. Why? Because repentance is the key. And the uncircumcised heart is not capable of repentance. Without repentance, obedience to God is impossible. And what do we call? What's the word for the lack of obedience to God? Sin. So without an uncircumcised heart, sin will continue to rule over us. The next thing he says 
<clears throat> I shall qu directly quote to you from one of his letters. Rabbi Zalman says this, Besides the physical deed, circumcision reflects a spiritual service. We find two references to this concept in the Torah. One verse declares, you shall circumcise the foreskin of your heart. The second declares, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. That is, there are two aspects of circumcision. One is performed by man in his striving to elevate himself from below to above. This service necessitates the circumcision of the heart. That is, the service of repentance. As it is written, you shall return to the Lord your God. This return is expressed through the fulfillment of the Torah and its commandments. And it will lead to the future redemption. As our sages declared, if the Jewish people turn to God in repentance, they will be redeemed. And if not, they will not be redeemed. So the good Rebbe says that somehow, sometime, the Lord must do a miraculous work from heaven. And that work is to circumcise the hearts of his people. This will finally enable repentance. And the repentance will enable redemption. Doesn't that sound a great deal like the gospel message to you? First repentance, then redemption. Paul took up the theme of circumcision of the heart in contrast with the circumcision of the foreskin and how it relates to Jews versus Gentiles. He did this in Romans chapters 2 and 3. Let's read some of that now. But I want you to keep in mind, as we do, what we've learned in Acts up to this point, what the problem is that caused this council of believing leadership to convene in Jerusalem, and that problem was Gentile inclusion and the question of circumcision, and what Rebbe Zalman just said about this absolute need for circumcision as the road to repentance, and how repentance, therefore, is the gateway to redemption. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, uh, we're going to be on page 1404. We're going to read from uh, chapter 2, verse 17, through chapter 3, verse 4. Follow along with me. <clears throat> but if you call yourself a Jew, and you rest on the Torah, and you boast about God, and you know His will, and you give your approval to what's right because you've been instructed from the Torah, and if you persuaded yourself that you are a guide to the blind, a light in the darkness, an instructor for the spiritually unaware, a teacher of children, since, the Torah you have, since in the Torah you have the embodiment of knowledge and truth, then you who teach others, don't you teach yourself? Preaching, thou shalt not steal. Do you steal? Saying, thou shalt not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? Detesting idols, do you commit idolatrous, idolatrous acts? You who take such pride in Torah, do you by disobeying the Torah dishonor God? As it says in the Tanakh, for it is because of you that God's name is blasphemed by the Goyim, by the Gentiles, by the nations. For circumcision is indeed of value if you do what the Torah says. But if you're a transgressor of Torah, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the Torah, won't his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Indeed, the man who is physically uncircumcised, but he obeys the Torah, will stand as a judgment on you 
who've had a brit milah, circumcision, and you have the Torah written out, but you violate it. For the real Jew is not merely Jewish outwardly. True circumcision is not only external and physical. On the contrary, the real Jew is one inwardly. True circumcision is of the heart. Spiritual, not literal. So that the, his praise comes not from other people, but from God. Then what advantage has the Jew? What's the value then of being circumcised? Much in every way. In the first place, the Jews were entrusted with the very words of God. If some of them were unfaithful, so what? Does their faithfulness cancel God's faithfulness? God forbid. God would be true even if everyone were a liar, as the Tanakh says, so that you, God, may be proved right in your words and win the verdict when you're put on trial. Here Paul is plainly talking to Jews in his audience. Next he goes into a speech about what circumcision is and is not. First notice that, the def that by definition the term the circumcised means Jews. And the term uncircumcised means Gentiles. But in Paul's dissertation... We have to grant him that the Gentiles he is speaking of are God-fearers. They are worshipers of the God of Israel. They aren't pagans. Further, since Paul's concern is, is, is not standard God-fearers, but rather specifically Gentile believers in Christ, God-fearers who also believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, then the contrast and comparison he is drawing is between those who have had a circumcision and are by definition Jews versus those who have not been circumcised and by any definition are not Jews. And his argument is that a Jew who claims to know and follow the Torah but disobeys it is less acceptable to God than a Gentile who doesn't know anything about the Torah, but he inherently obeys its principles. In fact, won't a Gentile, he says, be counted by God as a true Jew because he obeys the Torah principles? But a Jew who disobeys the Torah will be counted by God as though he's a Gentile meaning that from the spiritual aspect, he's outside of the set-apart people. And says Paul, that's because God counts as Jews those who have circumcised hearts, not only circumcised foreskins. Then moving on to Romans 3, just so his listeners don't confuse the ideal spiritual with the earthly physical, Paul makes it clear that Jews and Gentiles don't actually trade places. They don't trade in their Jewish bodies for Gentile bodies or vice versa. Gentiles don't gain Jewish national citizenship because they have a circumcised heart. Nothing physically changes because of a circumcised heart. Jews stay Jews, Gentiles stay Gentiles, and in fact, Jews continue to hold their preeminent place because God gave the Jews, the Hebrews actually, his written word, the Torah. So the conclusion is that the matter of circumcision comes down to a spiritual issue of the heart when it comes to a relationship with God and when it comes to repentance. And in this context, when it comes to redemption, to salvation. Please notice that this entire matter of a circumcised heart was already understood in Judaism. It was not a new concept. It was understood by many of the deep Jewish thinkers that a circumcised heart was needed for repentance and then repentance was needed for redemption. 
Rather, Paul was merely applying this principle to the issue of where Gentile God-fearers, or better, Gentile believers in Yeshua, stood in relation to the Jewish people and to God. But never miss this point. Circumcision was all about the Abrahamic covenant. It's where it emanated from. It's what it's all about. And redemption, especially concerning salvation in Christ, comes out of the Abrahamic covenant. Further, circumcision of the heart is the only means by which a Gentile can join in the spiritual benefits of the Abrahamic covenant. And who circumcises the heart? God. But it goes no further than the spiritual benefits. A Jew who is circumcised of the foreskin is the means by which he can join in the physical, earthly benefits of the Abrahamic covenant. He may be part of that physical, earthly covenant people, the Hebrews, so he may also be uh, a joint inheritor of the land that God gave to Abraham. But it goes no further. Rather, Jews must also have circumcised hearts as the only means to join the spiritual benefits of the Abrahamic covenant. And what are the spiritual benefits for both Jews and Gentiles? Forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins that even the Torah of Moses and the sacrificial system can't atone for. And of course, eternal life with God that up to now had never been available. And all this is provided by that special seed of Abraham that the Abrahamic covenant promised would indeed bless all the families of all the peoples on earth. And who is that seed of Abraham? Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. And that, my friends, is why Circumcision is such an important topic. A complex topic in both the Old and the New Testaments. It is why it is such a significant topic for this Jerusalem council in Acts 15. It is why Paul goes on this elaborate explanation, more than once by the way, about what circumcision actually is from both the physical and the spiritual aspects. What it means how central to repentance and redemption it is. And every bit of what we just learned is spelled out in God's Word. But how would we ever know if we were, unless we seriously studied the Torah and the Old Testament and trust it in its continuing relevance? We could accept this truth, I suppose, as a Christian doctrine, simply because the church authorities tell us so, and we have maybe elected to submit to their authority and knowledge, but isn't it better to actually see it develop for ourselves? To see it in the Word, to watch it happen, to find it clearly pronounced in God's Word, and not merely written as a short bumper sticker doctrine on a church program. Well, with that understanding now in mind, all this about circumcision, let's continue on now with our study of Acts chapter 15. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 1381. 1381. We're going to start at verse 12 and we're going to go to verse 21. <clears throat> then the whole assembly kept still as they listened to Barnabas and Shaul, Barnabas and Paul, tell what signs and miracles God had done uh, through them among the Gentiles. Yaakov, that's James, broke the silence to reply. Brothers, he said, hear what I have to say. 
Shimon, that's Peter, has told in detail what God did when he first began to show his concern for taking from among the Goyim, the Gentiles, a people to bear his name. And the words of the prophets are in complete harmony with this because it's written, after this I will return and I will rebuild the fallen tent of David and I will rebuild its ruins, I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. That is all the Gentiles who have been called by my name, says Adonai, who is doing these things. All of this has been known for ages. Therefore, my opinion is we should not put obstacles in the way of the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write them a letter telling them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from fornication, from what is strangled, and from blood. For from the earliest times, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, with his words being read in the synagogues every Shabbat. Let's remember that Barnabas and Paul, who have targeted the Gentiles for evangelism, are speaking before a group of leaders of the way who are Jerusalem-based. So Barnabas and Paul have their main experience in spreading the good news with the Gentile community, but they're the exception. Peter sides with them as well, to a point. Because Peter has taken the gospel to both Jews and Gentiles. And he had this amazing experience of his vision of the cloth descending from heaven with animals in it. Whereby he learned that God considers the Gentiles to be clean and not inherently defiled. So it is with respect and admiration that we read that the council remained quiet as Paul and Barnabas had their say on what was an emotionally charged, a hotly contentious batch of theological issues about circumcision and Gentile inclusion. Paul related the many miraculous things that God did among the Gentiles as proof that the Lord approved and was leading the way to bring the Gentiles on board. Now, once Paul and Barnabas have concluded their report, the supreme leader of the way, James, Yeshua's half-brother, stands and he addresses the council. And he begins by referring to what Shimon spoke about regarding Gentiles. Shimon is referring to Peter, called Simon Peter sometimes. And essentially what James is doing is going over the evidence that was presented and in doing so explains why he's going to rule on the matter the way he will. Now, this is the classic way that a rabbinical council regularly meets to discuss the matters of halakha, of Jewish law. It's also how the chief rabbi issues his final ruling. It would naturally go this way because this council saw itself as existing and operating fully within the context of a council of authoritative elders making a ruling of halakha that would govern their specific sect of Judaism the way. So James says that one of the strongest pieces of evidence in this case was presented by Peter. And James' key words to help us understand his position on this matter begin in verse 14. He says, Shimon has told us in detail what God did. So for James, the issue resolves itself because it's clear that God directly intervened with Peter and Cornelius and God stated what his will is on the matter. This was not hearsay then. This wasn't even an issue of scripture interpretation. God stated to Peter that Gentiles were not unclean. And after some time of contemplating what Yehovah's decision meant in the larger picture, Peter came to the conclusion that we read back in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, which he has relayed to the leadership of the way. There he said, then Kepha, Peter, addressed him, 
I now understand that God does not play favorites, but that whoever fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him no matter what people he belongs to. So now James connects prophecy with what Paul, Barnabas, and Peter have experienced and reported on to the council, that is their successful evangelizing of Gentiles, as he quotes now from Amos 9. And he says that what the prophets have said about the inclusion of Gentiles into God's kingdom was predicted and it's coming to pass right now. Let's detour again for just a moment. James's own brother was Messiah Yeshua. <laughs> and by the way, how terribly difficult that must have been for him to accept. It's very hard to have a familial relationship or even a friendship relationship with someone in which over an extended period of time you see one another as, as peers, as equals only to have one of you suddenly elevated in authority and status or even accomplishment well above yourself and the others. I mean, countless novels have been written about the broken relationships, the envy, the hatred, even revenge that comes with these sorts of things. But at the same time, when James was finally able to come to acceptance and submission to the truth of his own brother. Think about this, of his own brother. Think about your brothers, sisters. His own brother is not only the deliverer of Israel, that is the Mashiach, but also as divine. Can you imagine such a thing in your own family? I'd like you to greet my brother, God. It made James sensitive, moldable. It enabled him to view biblical prophecy in real, tangible terms, not just in theory, and apply it to current events. That is something that most Jews simply could not bring themselves to do. Not even the intellectual elite among them. And it shows up especially in the vast bulk of the Jewish people refusing to connect the prophecies about a coming Messiah to Yeshua. So they missed it. They missed it entirely. And the Jewish people suffer from it to this day. But because of Messiah's advent, all that came with it, James, as well as the leadership of the way, well, they were on the lookout for this very thing to happen. Prophecy that was being fulfilled right before their eyes. They were expecting more prophecy to come about. They wanted to recognize it. I attempt to occasionally intertwine prophecy into our lessons in order that we understand we are living in an age of prophetic fulfillment the likes of which has not been seen on this planet since the close of the New Testament. Do you realize that? Essentially, all prophetic fulfillments ended with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and then from then forward went into hibernation until it exploded back into action upon the rebirth of the nation of Israel in 1948. In fact, within Christianity, those almost 1900 dormant years caused trust and biblical prophecy to turn to skepticism. And that skepticism overflowed into the commentaries and the doctrines that underpin the mainstream Christian denominations as we know them in our time. So while end times prophecies about the tribulation and about Armageddon, oh, these things are all the rage, they tend 
to be mostly Western Gentile Christian focused. You ever notice that? And wherever Israel and the Jewish people are spoken of in these prophecies, much of Christianity merely scratches out the word Israel and inserts the word church. Thus, the happenings today with Israel, the migration of members of the ten lost tribes coming back to Israel, the persecution of the nations upon Israel, the battle for Jerusalem, the rise of Islam, and more, these things are regularly overlooked as not connecting with the prophecies that obviously speak of these very events at least to those who have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. But the Jerusalem Council was indeed looking at everything that was happening and comparing it eyes wide open to scriptural prophecies to see if it appropriately fit. And when it did, they accepted it, even if they didn't fully understand it even if, they didn't, if it didn't even necessarily sit well with them. I mean, the inclusion of Gentiles, that was not something that most Jews or even most of the disciples particularly welcomed. Rather, the Jews were looking for vindication of their status as God set apart people. They weren't looking for God's grace to be poured out upon the very people that were oppressing them. This prophecy of Amos that James quotes speaks of rebuilding the fallen tent of David. It was the coming of Yeshua, a royal descendant of David, who rebuilt David's legacy and his fallen tent. But as a result, says Amos' prophecy, the rest of mankind, that is non-Hebrews, will seek the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and Gentiles will accept God's offer. So James sees what is happening with Peter and Paul and Barnabas as the fulfillment of Amos chapter 9. Therefore, for James, the question now becomes, what do we do about it? That's the right question. What do we do about it? How does the council mold the halakha of the way in such a manner as to remove any barriers or impediments to God's prophetic will playing out with the Gentiles. That's what we'll cover next week. Thank you.